Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basik, in for Matt Miller. And from our studios in Washington, D.C., I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, it's a boom for Bitcoin. It hits 35000 as a court formalizes a victory for Grayscale, opening the door further for the first U.S. spot ETFs. We will hear from the DYDX CEO, Antonio Juliano, about this trading in cryptocurrencies and the move to a full decentralization of his derivatives exchange. And we're going to get the latest on the Sam Bankman free trial and a sneak peek at a new Bloomberg Originals documentary on the fall of FTX. Really looking forward to that one. And all of that is ahead. But first, let's get a snapshot of the market. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, C-R-Y-P, go. And what you will find is, as Shanali was alluding to, it is a really big update for Bitcoin. We aren't no anymore uh, north of that $35,000 level. Instead, we're just around the $34,000 mark, up by about 7.7% on the day. This is the highest Bitcoin has been going all the way back to May of last year. Ether and pretty much all digital assets taking part in this rally as well. Ether just south of 18 up by about 4.3 percent on the day. Of course, a lot of this has to do with what we've seen playing out with Grayscale, the Bitcoin Investment Trust, trying to convert to an ETF, a court sending that back to the SEC. While we wait to see what happens, investors are not waiting to bid up uh, that up by about five and a half percent. And of course, this is feeding through to other uh, stocks related to cryptocurrencies as well, Shanali, including Coinbase, the exchange. It's higher by about 7.3 percent on the day. How big is Bitcoin, Kaylee? Because if you think about it now, it's more than half of the market crap of all crypto assets. And part of that is not just because of the rise in Bitcoin itself, as you say, uh, the highest since May of last year. It's also because you have more coins being delisted from different exchanges. Between 2021 and 2022, that number more than doubled to about 3,000 coins delisted off of global exchanges. And now it's nearly 3,500 this year already. Part of this is in reaction to the SEC, which has listed different tokens in lawsuits against certain exchanges considering those token securities and exchanges not wanting to take the risk of being under the ire of the SEC. Now, what's interesting about this also is as we wait for the SEC to potentially approve or deny the Bitcoin ETFs, really what you'll see is just a big difference here in the types of crypto assets being traded on these exchanges. Absolutely. Well, let's talk more about that potential ETF, or at least the optimism around it, because, of course, a federal appeals court sent the Grayscale Bitcoin ETF case back to the SEC in a victory for the firm as it seeks to convert GBTC into an ETF. I spoke last week with the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, with his take on what was going on with Grayscale and the rest of the spot ETF filings we have seen. This is what he said. We have not one, but multiple, I think it's eight or ten filings that the staff and ultimately the commission is considering these exchange-traded products need to register with the SEC, and they go through a filing somewhat similar to going public, like an IPO. This is a time-tested process that goes back decades. It's like the staff of the SEC in a, in a it's called the disclosure review team, mm -hmm. but in that group, uh, they uh, respond and give feedback to potential issuers, uh, but I don't have any details on those individual conversations. So, Shanali, basically outlining the process, not really giving much of a hint if and when a spot ETF approval will come. And something else I asked him was, can you put to bed this notion that you're going to approve a bunch at once? Will someone get to go first? And he didn't really give an answer on that either. He says he doesn't want to prejudge anyone filing. It's amazing. It's a lot riding on that answer as well. And if you see the market is already expecting an approval. If you look at GBTC alone, it's only trading at about a 7% discount to its net asset value. That was 25 and even 40 a year ago. And that has narrowed so meaningfully as the market is already expecting an approval very soon. But there is no, yeah, so uh, there is no uh, sake that that will necessarily happen, we should say. Yeah, Shanali, that's absolutely right. There is no guarantee. All we have at the moment is optimism. So let's maybe get a dose of realism now and discuss with former practicing attorney at the SEC, Tom Gorman. He is also a partner at Dorsey and Whitney. So, Tom, thank you very much for coming back on Bloomberg Crypto. What do you think? Is a spot ETF approval a given? Well, thank you for having me. And no, it's not. Uh, Gary Gensler and the SEC have done a very good job of really trying to regulate uh, with the existing statutes 
uh, how Bitcoin and other different kinds of coins are, be are being regulated here. They have not had anything where they've let them onto a securities exchange yet, which is what you're talking about. There are, there are coins on the commodities exchange because the regulatory scheme over there is different. So I think for them to let one onto an ex a securities exchange, which they regulate as opposed to the commodity exchanges, uh, is going to be a very difficult lift. And if it does happen, it's I would expect it's going to take a while and there's going to be a fair amount of regulation written around it so that they can guard against the kinds of things that happen with some, some of these coins. Now, what's interesting about this, too, is some of the pushback you've seen from the SEC has to do with safety and security around Bitcoin itself. If you think about the SEC's uh, approving or not approving a new structure here, is it safer to buy Bitcoin under the ETF wrapper or not, given how much the structure has changed going into this process? If, if it's all wrapped up into a, into another kind of security or commodity, it may give you some additional safety. But still, at base root, if what you're looking at is a, a commodity like Bitcoin, which is really sort of, remember, remember that these things were brought out and the idea of them was get off the grid. They didn't want the SEC. They didn't want the CFTC. And they want to keep those things as much like that as possible. The problem with that is it creates huge problems. Uh, I understand, like, for example, that Hamas is now financing some of their operations mm. with these kinds of products. So you might think about that when you want to go think about buying this stuff. Well, Tom, I'm glad you brought that up because we know lawmakers on Capitol Hill are thinking about that. And actually, just last week, more than 100 of them, both in the Senate and the House, wrote a letter to the Treasury and Jake Sullivan over at the NSC saying, quote, that the deadly attack by Hamas on Israeli civilians comes as the group has become one of the most sophisticated crypto users in the terror finance domain, clarifies the national security threat crypto poses to the U.S., and our allies. Yet we have spoken, Tom, just last week with a, a cyber expert, a former uh, CIA, Yaya Fanusi, who's now with the Crypto Council of Innovation, who suggested the activity really wasn't all that great. And we know a lot of terrorist financing and other illicit activity is done in U.S. dollars. So what's your response here? Well, the, the problem is, is that they're using this to finance their operations. And it's difficult to tell uh, exactly how far they're going with this stuff. If they're using that, then what we have is terrorists using this using this medium that's traded freely in this country to raise money to to uh, inflict huge amounts of damage and injury and death on civilians. That shouldn't be allowed to be happening. But one of the things that makes it somewhat easy is the rate the, the, you can take these crypto coins, you can trade them on a commodity regulation with little or no oversight. <clears throat> and in, and you can raise money. You can't do that in the securities exchanges. It's much harder just because of the way you get on, the, on one exchange versus the other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's still a threat, and it's not something that we should be sanctioning when we're spending billions of dollars to try to tr protect people in these countries. Tom, what about this move by the Treasury Department? You look at their financial crimes enforcement <clears throat> network, known as FinCEN, and they're trying to really tackle the problem of crypto mixers, CVC mixing, where it makes it very difficult uh, to track how cryptocurrencies are being moved among accounts. Do you think that the Treasury Department could be successful, and will this start to clamp down on some of the issues that we're seeing? I think this is going to be very difficult for FinCEN. FinCEN has been putting out notices for several months at least, talking about this kind of potential activity and trying to uh, beef up how they do their enforcement. But FinCEN is not one of the great enforcers of our time. The SEC, on the other hand, has been, and they need to probably give the SEC a bit more authority, although I think they can do it with, with what they have got now, to try to protect people from this kind of incursion by somebody like Hamas who wants to, wants to use this stuff to finance the kind of terror that we've seen in the last few weeks. To the point that Kaylee was making earlier, you know, you had more than 100 lawmakers sign this letter to the NSA. Do you think that they can be actionable here in clamping down on some of these money flows, frankly, given how ineffective Congress has already been in creating any uh, rules around the crypto industry? 
Well, Congress from the beginning has failed to, to enact any statutes. If you remember back when this first became a problem, Gary Gensler called for regulation. He wanted new regulations. The next year, Gary turned around and said, we'll do it with what we've got. I think that was really a recognition of the fact that Congress wasn't going to pass anything. Treasury is not going to pass anything. And the most concentrated amount of regulatory authority is with the SEC. But realize, they've only got so much. They've added positions. They've brought a lot of cases. But there's a whole realm out there, say the commodity exchanges, for example. They have nothing to say about those. And even the CFTC has very little to say about those. You can get this stuff listed on a trading platform on, on a commodity exchange with little, little more than a bunch of paperwork. And then you've got the CFTC trying desperately to raise the margins and do things around the edges. But it's not really that effective. Tom Gorman, we thank you for your time. That is Tom Gorman, former practicing attorney at the SEC. What a relevant time to talk to you. Now, coming up next, DYDX CEO Antonio Juliano on Bitcoin's price movement and the latest update on his exchange. And later, Bloomberg Originals takes us inside the collapse of FTX and Sam Bankman Fried's crypto empire in the new documentary, Ruin. And the latest data on all the news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. Coming up next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Shanali Basak in New York with Kaylee Lines in Washington. Now, Bitcoin is pairing its gains after hovering above 35,000 for the first time since 2022. And joining us now for more is DYDX CEO Anthony Giuliano. If you look at the cooling off now of the trade, you think about the 26% or so rise that it had to the top at 35K. What's the next catalyst? Because it begs the question whether the SEC love for, or lack thereof rather, for an ETF is starting to cool off already. I think the biggest catalyst for all the bull markets we've seen so far in crypto have been some new innovation with the technology, some new product. I think the first one that was really exciting was ICOs and tokens back in 2017. And then it was the rise of DeFi in 2020 that kind of precipitated the big bull market of that time. So I really think it's going to be something new, something innovative that comes next, whether that's the ETF, whether that's some new development within DeFi or elsewhere within crypto. I think that'll be the thing that really catalyzes it. Well, and you have a something new happening at DYDX as well, Antonio, launching DYDX v4, full decentralization of your derivatives exchange. How much is that a response to regulators and their concerns? I wouldn't say it's a huge response to that. Really what we're trying to build here is an open, transparent financial system for the world. When I first started in crypto about eight years ago, I worked at Coinbase. And our mission at the time was to build an open financial system for the world. I really tried to carry that forward into what we're building with DYDX. DeFi is a financial system that's based on code. It's fully transparent, fully owned by its users, and that's what we're really excited about building. The news today is that DYDX has released the DYDX chain, which is our move towards full decentralization of DYDX for the first time, where we can really realize all of these values that we've been working for for years in crypto for the first time on DYDX. So, Antonio, correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll have this new chain and then you'll also still have the existing change. Am I correct? How do you how do you see activity moving between the two? Is is your objective to switch everything onto this new chain? So both will run in parallel for a while. Obviously, we're excited about what we're building with the DYDX chain and do feel like that's the future of DYDX, a platform that's fully decentralized, but still is focused on derivatives trading, first and foremost, within crypto. Derivatives trading in crypto has quickly become the most popular market within crypto. About 75% of derivatives trading volume or crypto trading volume, that is, happens in derivatives. So it's a huge market. DeFi is still a small part of that, 
but we're excited to be the leader in DeFi plus derivatives and build that into really the primary way, hopefully someday, that crypto is traded. Well, is this mostly retail investors or institutions that are driving the volume? It's both. So we have two main classes of users. One is crypto institutions, as you've been saying. And there's been a huge influx of these institutions into DeFi over the past few years, really led first and foremost by DYDX. We've tried to position ourselves as an exchange and a DeFi platform where institutions in retail and specifically professional individual retail can come together to trade. I think that's the really fundamental innovation of crypto is that it's created this new class of global traders in individual retail traders. Really, when people say retail traders, a lot of times I, I feel like people think about, oh, your grandma, your friend who bought their first Bitcoin yesterday. That's not who DYDX, at least, is targeting. We're really targeting these more sophisticated individual traders and giving them, for the first time, access to these powerful financial tools in a global way. You're talking a lot about DeFi that assumes things outside of Bitcoin. But when you see the sheer market cap of Bitcoin relative to all crypto tokens, the delisting of so many tokens just this year alone, let alone the last three, four years, what's the case for DeFi when so much money is flocking to Bitcoin and the market is simply more liquid? Well, you can trade Bitcoin in DeFi too. That's the beauty of derivatives contracts. So actually Bitcoin is the most widely traded asset on DYDX. And really you can trade all these different types of assets. There's fundamentally different things within crypto, right? There's assets, all these new asset classes like Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the other tokens people love to trade. And then there's fundamentally new products. What we're building at DYDX is a product. It's a way you can trade crypto and other assets. And that's really what we're focused on. And yet we do see a lot of market share still centered in these centralized exchanges. FTX obviously long gone now, but the likes of Binance, you just haven't actually seen all of that activity uh, switching to DeFi in the way that maybe would, would have thought happened just about a year ago. Why do, you, why do you think that is? And do you think that's going to change in the near term? So I think the fundamental reason for this is change takes longer than people think, especially new technological change. People, I think, have the right idea about new technologies when they come out. When Ethereum was invented, people were very excited about, wow, this is a fundamentally new way you can build technology, a fundamentally new way finance can operate and other products can be built. And people were right about that, and there was a lot of hype around it. But these things take a really long time, and you've seen this in fundamentally new technologies throughout the years. And I think the same thing is happening within crypto. We have to understand that DeFi is only five years old. Five years might seem like a long time, but I say to everyone, our goal at DYDX is to become one of the biggest exchanges in crypto, but not this year, not next year, in five to 10 years from now. And I think really if we start zooming out and thinking about things on that time scale, it makes a lot more sense why we should be excited about this innovation within crypto rather than just what's happening today. All right, Antonio, thank you so much for joining us. Antonio Giuliano of DYDX, we appreciate it. This is Bloomberg. Now to a story that just came out on Bloomberg. FTX Trading is considering proposals from three bidders to restart trading. The company will make a decision about how to proceed by mid-December. This is according to the company's investment banker, Kevin Kofsky of Perella Weinberg Partners, who spoke during a court hearing in Wilmington, Delaware today. And Shanali, let's stick with the FTX story because Ruin is a new documentary by Bloomberg Originals that dives into the collapse of FTX as narrated by Bloomberg journalists and some of the central players in the rise of digital assets. Here's a sneak preview. I don't think he even had almost a conception at some point that it was wrong or right. I think he just had the mentality that he has to win. It was almost like trying to explain like business ethics 101 to a baby. Sam has basically become a villain in everyone's minds. This committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. Will this be the last of its kind? No, this is the nature of capitalism. Get over it.
Now let's bring in one of those journalists in Ruin, Bloomberg's Hannah Miller. So Hannah, just watching that makes me super excited to see the whole thing. Can you tell us a little more about what we should expect? Yeah, so we get an inside look into the collapse of FTX, but we also look at the crypto industry more broadly. And I think it really helps set a foundation for understanding, you know, what went wrong in this industry over the past two years. And we hear some from, we hear from some pretty colorful characters within the industry. What do those people reveal about the way that FTX was functioning and why it really matters today? Because what's remarkable about this documentary is really coming out in the middle of the trial of Sam Bankman Freed. Yeah, one of my favorite interviews for the documentary was with Alex Pack, who was a venture capitalist who passed on investing in Alameda Research. And this was before FTX was started. And Alex Pack saw major red flags. He saw issues from the beginning. So I think we get, you know, this idea that things were pretty wrong from the start uh, with both Alameda and FTX. Uh, and it's been really fascinating to see things unfold in real time and have to make a documentary, you know, about Thing, you know, thing, still moving pieces within the crypto industry. Yeah, absolutely. If there's anything we know about crypto, Hannah, it's that it, it moves very fast. How much does this take a forward look as well and to not just what happened within the industry and FTX, but where it goes from here in the aftermath? Yeah, I think the documentary asks some pretty interesting questions about what will Sam Bankman-Fried's legacy be? You know, this was someone who publicly claimed to support good causes and be an effective altruist, you know, but obviously uh, his legacy has been extremely tarnished by what happened with FTX. You're kind of talking, so I think there is. Yeah, yeah. Hannah, really quickly here, you were talking about how this took a broader lens at the crypto industry. And after uh, this had been finished up, Gemini and DCG were sued by New York's attorney general for alleged crypto fraud. What's still wrong about the industry that has not been fixed yet? Yeah, so I think people are, you know, realizing that regulators are cracking down on crypto. I've talked to founders who are moving their businesses abroad. You know, they're, they want to work environments where they're not going to have as, as much vigilance. Um, so it's been really interesting to see that, you know, there are still victims of bankruptcies who have not gotten their funds mm -hmm. back. Uh, there are still founders, you know, who are raising money for dubious projects. Um, yeah. <laughs> Still a lot happening. All right. Well, it's a great preview. Everybody go out and watch it. Bloomberg's Hannah Miller, thank you very much. And of course, Ruin, Money, Ego, and Deception at FTX airs Wednesday at 8 p.m. New York time right here on Bloomberg Television. Now, Hannah was just mentioning bankruptcies. A headline just crossing the terminal. BlockFi says it has emerged from bankruptcy as of today. So we'll have more on that for you next week on Bloomberg Crypto. Anthony Scaramucci will join. This is Bloomberg.